Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Bless you, man. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. We serve a mighty God, don't we? Amen. An awesome God. I'll tell you what, God wants to do something bigger by His Spirit than we can even imagine. If we'll position ourselves, allow Him to do what He desires to do, He wants to do something bigger by His Spirit. Above and beyond, I want you to believe God for great things. Amen. Amen. Believe it for your families. Believe it for this church. Believe it for your community, for the city. And, uh, and if you'll have faith, God will do it. Praise the name of the Lord. Turn our Bibles this morning, uh, if you would, to Matthew chapter 21. We're going to begin there. All right, uh, Matthew chapter uh, 21. Matthew chapter 21, is, it begins with dealing with, it's really the triumphal entry, first part of, of chapter 21, and I'm not going to take the time to read all of that. Uh, but I'm going to pick up in verse 10. The Bible says, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 10, it says, And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Verse 12, And Jesus went into the temple of God, and he cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Now, let me just pause there for a moment. Now, the thing is, is there is nothing wrong with the selling, uh, and actually what they were selling is, is sacrifice. Uh, animals that, that would be used for the sacrifice uh, because people would come from long distances to worship the Lord and they would uh, you know not be able to bring their own sacrifice so there would be those that would sell you know whatever turtle doves whatever uh, would be necessary for sacrifice so in that in itself there was nothing wrong with that however the problem was that they got their focus off of what the meaning of the sacrifice was and they began to use it as an opportunity to uh, fleece the people of God. And it became just a big money scam. Uh, how many churches today that is the case? Amen. Using the sacrifice for their own gain, for their own uh, benefit. So that's really what's going on here. Nothing wrong with, with selling and, and, and buying in the temple. All right. Uh, in verse 13, but he said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the what? The house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. You see, we as individuals and churches corporately are either going to be a house of prayer or a den of thieves. And what determines really whether it is a, going to be a house of prayer and whether it's going to be a den of thieves, what really determines that is what they do with the sacrifice. How they handle the sacrifice. How they look at the sacrifice, how they appropriate the sacrifice. And of course, when I refer to the sacrifice, I'm not referring to lambs, I'm not referring to rams and turtle doves and... I'm referring to the sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and I want to emphasize something in this. I've preached out of this passage before and actually emphasized other things, but I want to emphasize that thought, and we're going to go somewhere else and look at some things as well, but uh, I want to emphasize the importance of the sacrifice and appropriating it properly in reference to prayer and the effectiveness of our prayer. Amen? Uh, pray with me this morning. I'm going to need the help of the Holy Spirit. Father, we love you today. We thank you. Thank you for your presence in this house, Lord. And Father, we don't take lightly the opportunity and the privilege that we have to stand before your people. And Father, I'm just asking this morning that you will use me to communicate your message to these, your people, Father. Use me despite me, Lord. Father, I pray that you give us revelation, you give us understanding, Lord. I pray that you anoint my lips, you anoint my heart, Father. 
And Lord, help me to communicate only that which you want me to communicate. Nothing more, nothing less. Father, that your people may be edified, encouraged, and strengthened in the direction that you would have them to be edified, strengthened, and encouraged today, Heavenly Father. We love you. We commit this time into your hands, and we say it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Either a house of prayer or a den of thieves. You know, when you think of a a house, or first of all, let me say it this way. When you think of a den, a den of thieves, and incidentally, that what that means, a den of thieves, it's referring to religious thieves who have their own agenda. You see, we as believers, we can't have our own agenda. We got to have God's agenda. Amen? So that's really what Jesus is, is referencing there, a den of thieves. Thieves are religious thieves who have their own agenda. They want money. They want, uh, uh, you know, things for their own pleasure, for their own self, whatever the case may be. Their focus is not the things of God and is not the sacrifice. And this is really, again, this is what the problem is here. And when you think of a den, you think of a, a temporary staying place, all right? I am staying in a hotel right now while I am here. That's not home for me, all right? That's not my house. It's not home. It works for a few days, but I wouldn't want to live there. Uh, I look forward to it. It's been a blessing to be here, and I thank God for the opportunity. But I love my home, and I want to be in my home uh, with my family and my house. So a den that speaks of a temporary dwelling place. See, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You individually are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And corporately, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We are the house of God. And we have to ask ourselves the question, are we just a den? A temporary staying place that the Lord doesn't really feel at home in? Using the, uh, the illustration here, Jesus entering into the temple. Don't you thank God that there was a day when I'm, I'm assuming that everyone in here was born again. If you're not, we can take care of that today. You can accept Jesus Christ into your heart. He can come into your temple. Amen. But if you're born again, that's what happened is Jesus came into your temple. Amen. And he came to set up home. He came to set up shop, so to speak, if I could say it that way. I mean, he's coming. He came into you to stay and to feel comfortable and to be at home in you individually. And we'll even say in this assembly here, corporately, he wants to be at home here. His dwelling place. Amen. He dwells in his children. He dwells in these temples of the Holy Ghost. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Individually and corporately, that is in fact the case. So are we a proper dwelling place for God? You know, Paul would say this, and I don't want to go too far. This is not the, the gist of my message. But Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 3 when he was praying for the believers there. He prayed this. He prayed that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And that word dwell means to abide, and it's the idea of may he feel at home in you. You see, because he was praying for believers here. These weren't unbelievers. He wasn't praying for unbelievers for them to accept Christ. He was praying for believers that Christ may dwell, abide, that he may feel at home in them. Amen? And that should be our prayer as well. Lord, I pray that you feel at home in me. I don't want to just be a den of thieves, a temporary staying place that, that my, my temple is so polluted and, and, and so rotten and, and, and so misfocused, not focused properly on the sacrifice, on the right thing, that Jesus doesn't feel at home in my temple. So two types of individuals, two types of churches there, dens of thieves, or uh, yeah, dens of thieves and a house of prayer, a dwelling place of God. We want to be a dwelling place of God. Amen. A house of prayer, it meant that intercession, praise, and petition should be going up to God constantly from the temple. You see, God wants you individually. Listen now. He wants you individually as a believer, and He wants this house corporately. He wants it to be a place where intercession is constantly going up before Him. 
You know that when you live your life properly in Christ and Christ is dwelling in you properly and the Spirit of God has His proper place in you and He has the liberty and the leeway to flow in you, He is the great intercessor, amen, that you can live a lifestyle of prayer. You can live a lifestyle of prayer. You as a believer, you as an individual, you can live in a spirit of prayer. That's why Paul, what do you think Paul meant when he said pray without ceasing? Be instant in prayer. Constantly be in prayer. Amen? Pray without ceasing. How do you do that? I mean, I've got to be on my knees 24 hours a day? No. God knows that you can't do that. Uh, and I'm not neglecting or negating the, the importance of having a quiet time. You have your quiet time. You spend that time with the Lord. And as I suggest, and as Jesus commanded, you pray according to the covenant prayer pattern that He gave. And let me tell you something. That will launch you into a lifestyle of prayer because it will make the covenant real to you. And the presence of God will be real to you. And you will find yourself throughout your day living as a house, a temple of prayer, constantly interceding before God. Amen. That's what God wants from us. But we got to get rid of our carnality. we got to get rid of our, our selfishness and, and, and our own agenda. We don't want to be in the category of being a religious thief that has our own agenda. But the focus here, and this is what I want to emphasize in this before we turn over to another passage here, is the sacrifice. Before you can become a house of prayer individually and corporately, the sacrifice, the sacrifice has to have its proper place, his proper place. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Lift it up. What did he mean? Lift it up on the cross. You see, when you get the sacrifice right, then everything else falls into its proper place. And prayer falls into its proper place when you get the sacrifice right. Amen? And what I believe with all my heart, what God is doing, He's doing it in this church, and I'm addressing this church, but He's doing it in the body of Christ, is He's bringing us to the place to where we get the sacrifice right. And we become a house of prayer. Amen? You see, because as I shared the last couple of nights, God can't move outside of God's people humbling themselves, praying, seeking His face. God cannot move outside of the effectual, fervent prayer of His children. He cannot move. His hands are tied. Imagine that. God's hands are tied by our prayerlessness, by first of all, neglecting the sacrifice, not appropriating it properly, and then not entering into the place of prayer that He desires us to be so that He can move in this earth. That he can move in this church. As I said at the beginning, I believe that God wants to do something bigger by His Spirit than anything that we can even think or imagine. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those. And He's not just talking about heaven, my friend. He's talking about those who put their faith in the cross. Those who live their lives in Christ. God wants to do something in your life and in your midst above and beyond anything that you can even think or imagine. I want you to get to the place to where you're aiming a little higher. That you're believing God for greater things. And desiring Him to do greater things in your individual life. In your families. In your church. In your community. In your nation. God wants to use you as a house of prayer. But we got to get the sacrifice right. And I believe that this church has got the sacrifice right. It's on the right track. Amen? Amen? Turn your Bibles to, again, back to Second Chronicles and chapter 7. We're not going to deal with verse 14 like we did last night, but I'm going to deal with everything around it, or at least some things that are around it. Uh, the book of Second Chronicles, we begin here with the reign of King Solomon. Uh, First Chronicles, as Pastor uh, quoted from, dealing with David uh, in his reign. And then Second Chronicles begins the reign of Solomon. And the first several chapters begins dealing with the building of the temple. All right, 
the building. These passages in these first several chapters give details concerning the building of the temple and then the furnishings that are uh, to be in the temple. And, uh, and in chapter uh, 6, we see Solomon's prayer, a whole chapter here devoted to a prayer that he prayed. If we were to look at chapter 6 and verse 19, the beginning of his prayer, he would say, Have respect, therefore, to the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee. And uh, I would encourage you to read that when you have the time. A powerful prayer, praying that, uh, that God would hear from heaven. You see it over and over again, that if the children of Israel, I'll just summarize it, I don't have time to deal with it, but if the children of Israel, basically, if they would stray away, from God, that they would stray away from the covenant, that if they will repent, all right? And, and, and Solomon would say uh, over and over again, then hear thou from heaven, forgive the sin of thy servants. Uh, that was his desire, that was his heart, that was his prayer. But we see here the importance of the, of, of the temple, all right? The temple that was that was built, and I want to use the comparison, the analogy of that physical temple that was being built to the spiritual temple that God is building in His church. God is building a house, amen? In this assembly, God is building a temple. He's building a house. Listen now. He is putting everything in its proper place. He's bringing in the, uh, the furnishings, the equipment, the, the giftings, the individuals that are, that are needed to uh, fulfill the work of the temple. Amen? Uh, of course, in, the, in this time frame, it was a physical temple. Now it is the church. We are the temple uh, of the living God. But I want to draw your attention to the focus here, all right? Uh, of this temple. Let's begin in chapter 7 and verse 1. It says this, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. I don't know about you, but that's what I want to see. Amen? Amen. But notice the, the uh, tying in with the sacrifices, the offerings, the sacrifices. You see, you will find in the Old Covenant, you will find every time that it refers to the glory of the Lord manifesting itself, it's always tied in with the sacrifices. Every time, without exception. And that should tell us something. If we really want the glory of the Lord, we've got to get the sacrifice right. We've got to get our focus right. We've got to have Jesus Christ and Him crucified, the preeminent thing within our individual lives and within our body, within our churches. And if we'll do that, then there is a recipe for the glory of God to fill our houses. The glory of the Lord filled the house. And notice this. This is what I want to see. Glory to God. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord. Because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Amen. Our God is good. His mercy endures forever. Glory to God. Verse 4, and then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice, notice this, of 20 and 2,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. Notice the focus on the sacrifices. You say, why so many sacrifices? Why wasn't one sufficient to uh, uh, speak of the coming sacrifice, of the coming Redeemer, because I believe God wanted to show the importance and the significance of the sacrifice. That one wasn't enough. It took thousands to get the people to get the picture, to see as 
lamb after lamb, as animal after animal, innocent lambs and animals were slain and were, were offered up as a sacrifice, speaking of the coming sacrifice. We're talking here in one setting here. A total of 140,000, if I'm adding correctly, but anyhow, right around there. A whole lot of innocent animals sacrificed, oxen and lambs. My goodness, sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. Verse 6, and the priests waited on their offices, the Levites, and with instruments of music of the Lord which David the king had made to praise the Lord because his mercy endureth forever. When David praised by their ministry and the priests sounded trumpets before them and all Israel stood, moreover Solomon hallowed the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the peace offerings because the brazen altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offering and the meat offerings, and the fat. In other words, there were so many sacrifices. The brazen altar wasn't big. They just had to clear out a whole place, a whole area to offer up the sacrifices because of what God was trying to tell them, the significance of the sacrifice pointing to the coming Redeemer. Don't lose sight of it. Moreover, Solomon hallowed the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the peace offerings, because the brazen altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings and the meat offerings and the fat. Jump down to verse 12. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. Glory to God. What I come to tell you today, and what I believe with all my heart, is specifically for this house. And pastors, you all weigh this within your own spirit, but I believe that the Lord spoke it to me. This is a house of sacrifice. Amen. In other words, the focus is the sacrifice, the cross, the crucified Lord of glory. And any house, any church that will lift up the sacrifice, the same thing can be said of that one. And that's what God is doing in these last days. He's getting the church to focus on the sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. What He did on the cross. I have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, you'd have to go back to Solomon's prayer in chapter 6 to really understand what he's referring to there. And then we go into the famous passage of Scripture that we dealt with last night. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And notice verse 15, all right. Now, notice that statement. Now, mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. Why now? Because it was a house of sacrifice. I mentioned this last night. There are a whole lot of houses, churches, individual believers, that God's ear, His eyes are not open to them and His ears are not att attent unto the prayer of them. Because they don't have the sacrifice right. If you miss the sacrifice, if you miss... Uh, true faith, if you miss truly uh, the covenant of God, if you miss everything pertaining to the sacrifice, then God's ear is not attentive and His eyes are not open unto your prayers. But what I come to tell you today as a word for this church is that God's eyes are open. God's ears are attentive. Listen to me now. Amen. 
to the prayers in this house. Listen. Listen to me. To the prayers in this house. What I'm exhorting you to do is I'm, I'm exhorting you to ask God and to ask God big. Amen. Amen. To believe your God to do great things in your midst because His eyes are open unto you. And His ears are attentive unto your prayers. I'm saying go crazy in prayer. Amen? I'm telling you to get radical with it. Believe God for your families. Believe God for this community. Believe God for this city. Believe God for our nation. I'm not just trying to hype you. I believe that that is the case. His eyes are open. His ears are attentive. You know, God longs to hear His people pray and beseech Him in faith, properly according to having the foundation of the sacrifice. Because then He can hear you, then He can move. He longs to do so much in the midst of His people. He longs to do so much in your individual lives. He longs to do so much in your families. He longs to do so much in this church. His ears and His eyes are open. Will you, in faith, begin to, begin to cry out to a God whose ears and eyes are open and desiring to move. Ask big. Believe big. Believe Him for His glory. Believe Him for His power. Are any of you getting this? I'm, I'm looking at your countenances and I can't really tell. Do you want God? Do you want His glory? Do you want His power? Do you want His presence? Do you want to see souls saved? If you don't want that, you're probably in the wrong place. If you're just here to take up space in a pew and do your religious duty for a couple hours, a couple times a week, you're in the wrong place. I believe that this is a house that wants the glory, the glory of God, the presence of God. You want to see souls saved. You want to see people in this community and this city. You want to see them saved and sitting in these seats and receiving the word of Almighty God. God wants you to begin to ask Him big. Do it in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Have faith. Glory to God. Verse 16, for now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. Why? Because they had the sacrifice right. Their focus was right. My God, you don't, you don't realize the favor. Some of you are having a hard time accepting this and grasping this. You don't understand the favor that you have as a child of God that is believing properly, my friend. Believing properly. The favor that you have. A God in heaven. The creator of the universe. The one who can do all things. Omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. God of all glory. The God who knows all things. Elohim, Adonai, El Shaddai, Yahweh. Creator God of all strength and all power and all might and all glory. His ear is attentive. His eyes are open. And He's waiting for you to begin to cry out to Him. Lord, I'm desperate for a move. I need you to move in my life. I need you to move in my family. We want you to move in this church. Manifest your power, your glory, your presence. Save the lost. Save the lost, Lord. Begin to pray for the harvest. Lord, bring in the harvest. 
Bring them in from the north, from the south, from the east, and from the west. Bring them in. God's ear is open. His eyes are open unto you. Will you ask? And will you ask big, knowing that you have His favor? You have His hand, His blessing. He's just saying, I just wish my people would ask me. My people, those who have believed me properly, got the sacrifice right, I'm just waiting for them to ask me and believe me for great and mighty things. You're not asking big enough, people. You're not asking big enough. God can do all things. He can do all things. A very familiar passage of Scripture, and I'll close here. Mark chapter 11. I kind of quoted it last night. Mark chapter 11. Ties in with what I'm bringing to you. Mark chapter 11, uh, of course, dealing, actually it deals with uh, uh, the passage that we dealt with in Matthew regarding the temple. Um, but if we were to continue on here, it deals with uh, Jesus cursing the, uh, the fig tree. And incidentally, Jesus didn't just curse a fig tree because he just felt like it and he was angry at the fig tree. Uh, he always did things as for a purpose. And the purpose was to be a, a picture, an illustration of the spiritual condition of Israel not producing fruit, didn't have proper faith, didn't understand the sacrifice, didn't understand why the purpose of the sacrifices under the Old Covenant, and didn't understand Him, the Messiah, the one who was to come to be the sacrifice. They didn't understand it. They didn't have proper faith, so therefore they were like that fig tree that didn't produce any fruit. It was withered and dried up. It looked good on the outside. It had nice green leaves. Sounds like a lot of Christians, doesn't it? Hypocrites, man. You see them from a distance, and boy, they look good. But you begin to pry a little bit in their life as a fruit inspector, and mm, there ain't no fruit there. Hypocrite. You know what a hypocrite is? It's an actor. You act. You act like a Christian. God's not looking for actors in the kingdom of God. He's looking for those that will be like Christ, that will live the life of Christ. Amen. You don't want to find yourself being cursed. He cursed the fig tree. And then we continue on here. And uh, let's see, I'll just pick up, uh, I'll pick up in, uh, I'll just pick up in verse 19. And the even was come, and he went out of the city. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter calling to remember, and saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And notice Jesus' response, these four words. Have faith in God. That's all he says. What he was saying is, hey, this would not have happened. I would not have had to do this if they had faith in God. And what that means, I mentioned it last night, it means literally to have the faith of God. Have the God kind of faith. In fact, when you look in the Greek, the word God is in, and I'm not a Greek person, but uh, this is what I read after a Greek scholar. The word God is in the genitive case, showing here the object of faith. Does that sound familiar? The object of faith. Have the faith of God. Have proper faith. Have the God kind of faith. Not the world's concept of faith and the worldly church's concept of faith as I'm just, I'm believing God for more stuff and more money. That's, that's faith, you know. That's, that's not biblical faith, folks. You will find that biblical faith always without reservation or it, it always ties in with the cross every time faith is never intended to be used for you to get your stuff never amen i know you have a hard time accepting that because you want your stuff but you know what you need to want more is you need to want a relationship with god through the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did at the cross of Calvary. That's what faith is meant for. To tie you into Calvary. To tie you in with Jehovah God and to give you a relationship with Him. That's the faith of God. Paul said it this way in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That sounds like Christianity, doesn't it? And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live it by the what? The faith of the Son of God. 
See, what that means, the faith of, is it speaks of his faithfulness to go to the cross. In essence, Paul was saying, I live this life by the cross. By the cross. The faith of Christ. The one who was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Faith, that's proper faith. Have faith in God. Have the faith of God. And what happens when you have proper faith? when you have the sacrifice right, when Jesus has His proper place in your life individually and in a body, this is what happens. Verse 23, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. That's a pretty heady uh, promise there. And the only way that's going to work is if you have proper faith. If you have the faith of God. Because if you're carnal, you're going to try to use that to get your stuff. To get your money, get your bigger car, and get your bigger house. This is one of the key passages that the so-called word of faith people use. But they don't emphasize the proper faith. See, because when you have proper faith, you know what you're going to be crying out to God for and asking for and speaking and declaring? Lord, we want your spirit. Lord, we want your glory. We want your presence. Lord God, I want to see this mountain of sin removed from my life. I want to see every demonic power that is trying to destroy me. I want to see it removed from my life so that I can be a greater testimony of who you are. That's what you're going to ask for. Lord, I want to see a harvest. Lord God, move principalities and powers in our city so that the harvest can be loosed in the name of Jesus. And can come forth. That's the mountain. And that's what biblical faith will produce. Then you have the right to do that. Whatsoever you ask for. Whatsoever you say it. Notice that speaking. Speak it. Declare it. Lord, I declare your kingdom come. I declare your will be done. I declare it in my children. I declare it in my husband and my wife. I declare it in my church. You need to have kind of a militant attitude, my friend, because you are in a war. And there's a devil out there that wants to destroy you and destroy your family and destroy your church. And you better get serious about it and you better begin to stand in faith and begin to declare, Lord God, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Lord, I want your glory. Begin to believe God. Believe God big. Whatsoever you shall say unto this mountain. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain. God will move that mountain. Not to, of course. The reason why Jesus used a, the analogy of a mountain is because it's obvious that he's not talking about a physical mountain. He's talking about the mountains of difficulties and spiritual things that need to be removed in our lives. And then he continues on here, verse 20, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them, and when you stand praying, forgive, so on and so forth. But the idea here is that you have proper faith. You have proper faith, my friend. You have the right, and you have the privilege. Listen to me now. Don't lose this, this word. You have God's ear. Listen. Believe big. But you got to begin to ask. you got to begin to believe big. You have God's ear. His ear is attentive. Unto your heart cry. His eyes are open unto this house. Don't forget it. You say, is that just, be, you know, we're special? No, you're special because you, you have the cross as your focus. Amen. As I said, any church that will do that, God's ear and God's eye is open unto them. But know that for this house that you have His favor. Now begin to ask Him and ask Him big. Glory. You don't know what God wants to do by His Spirit. 
in your life, in your family, and in this church. And it's only as you begin to believe Him, begin to have faith, and begin to ask Him big, and He begins to do it, that you will begin to know. So the exhortation to you is, begin to take advantage of the favor that you have with the Lord, not because of anything that you have done, not because of your, the way you look, the way you act, the church you go to, other than what is preached, what is lifted up, and what is declared in this house, what is emphasized, which is the sacrifice. This is a house of sacrifice. Family Worship Center is a house of sacrifice. Jesus Christ and Him crucified is lifted up. And we have God's favor. Now what are we going to do with it? Are we going to ask Him? And ask Him big. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. If the worship team could come back. Hallelujah. I just really, just as a, as a response to this word, and I'll just say this and I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Pastor Jim and uh, the worship team can just begin to worship. But as a response to this word and as a faith response, I want you to come to this altar with a believing heart, a believing heart. That's going to make a declaration before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to believe you big. I'm believing you for those lost loved ones in my family that it seems impossible. They're so entrenched in sin and the powers of darkness are so overcoming their lives. But I'm going to have faith because I believe that I have your favor. Because my focus is Jesus Christ and him crucified. So if that's you this morning and you want to make that declaration, you want to begin to believe God, I want you to come to these altars. God will meet you here. Glory to God. Alama paka la kuma la mama mama hai. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just worship him for a few more minutes. Oh, hallelujah. Surrender unto him. Surrender. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Yes, surrender. Surrender. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you for receiving us, Father. Thank you for working with us. Thank you, Lord, for changing us. Thank you for moving upon us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your long suffering. Yes. Thank you, Father. God has heard our cry this morning. And as Pastor Borg said, we have his ears. He is watching us. And now we must have something to say. We must have something to pray. And we must begin a new chapter in the Berean Assembly. I'm telling you, we have turned a corner, people. And God now has given us His ear. And we need to pray for the lost. That is so on my heart, people. There isn't much time. There are people out there that are being destroyed by the power of sin. God has given us, through His covenant, authority and power. As kings and priests, we can worship Him. And we can take authority over the powers of darkness. And we can begin to solicit God Almighty. He said, if we... Hear me now. If we delight after His heart. Do you hear what I'm saying? 
if we delight after His heart, He will give us the petitions that we ask of Him. People, there's nothing more important than the eternal soul. And we now have been given an edict from God Almighty. And we are going to enter into a time of war, a time of prayer. And we are going to enter into a time of faith. And we are going to believe God. And we are going to expect God to bring in those that are lost. What we have as a responsibility of the church is what He has called us to do right here. And it's going to depend upon each and every one of you. Don't look to the one to the left to take care of what God has called you to do. Don't look to the right or behind you or in front of you. You look to what it is that God is doing in you. And don't you let the devil lie to you. He has a mission for you. Amen. Praise God. I don't know about you, but something has taken place in me this weekend, people. There's something that's taken place that is very serious, very spiritual, that God is doing on the inside of us. And God has handed us the responsibility. Now don't drop it. Don't let it go. And I believe God is going to do something mighty, brother, in your life. I see it in your eyes. I see the hunger there that God is going to fulfill, my friend. Amen. 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 Praise God. It's a good day. It's a good day. Because our King reigns. Our Lord and Savior. He's a deliverer. And He will fulfill His Word and His promises in us. And I thank Him this morning. I am so glad to be a part of this family right here, people, of what God is doing. I thank Him for it. Amen. I thank Him for it. Heavenly Father, as we come to the close of this service, Lord, let not our minds be closed to the message, but let our hearts meditate upon it, Father. And let us meditate, God, upon your heart. Let us meditate upon what you have spoken to us this morning, Father. And Satan, I bind you by the power of the blood of Christ that you'll not steal this seed that has been sown in the hearts of your people. Lord, I thank you, God, for what you have done. I thank you, Father. And Lord, once again, I pray, God, that you would strengthen your people. Keep them, Father, and lead them by your Spirit, Father. And I pray for Christ to be manifested and formed in their lives, Lord. And let that hunger burn, Father, inside. And Father, I thank you once again. And Lord, I pray, bring your people back at the appointed time according to your perfect will and bless all of your people. And all of God's people said, Amen. Love one another.